Bienvenido a Desde Cero con Manuel. Welcome to Right From The Start. Today's guest, we have Maritza Cifuentes Chavarria. Maritza, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, first of all, I want to apologize for delaying our podcast because oh. we went through some family things yeah. and, uh, and I appreciate your patience. And uh, I'm glad you, you're here now. Yeah, And uh, we're here to talk about uh, what uh, you have going on. And uh, we're here to talk about the upcoming elections. Yeah. Right? And also, uh, we're here to find out more about Maritza. Yep. So let's uh, start right from the beginning. Right. Uh, where where were you born? Right here. Bryan College Station, Texas. Well, I was born in Bryan. Bryan. But I consider the entire county my home. Right. Uh, and uh, we live in the Brazos County. Yep. Right. Brazos County. Uh, parents. So my mother is Josephine Cipuentes, and she has a huge, huge family. Um, a lot of people probably know them um, because they also grew up here. Generate. I think it's I'm three generations deep now, maybe two. Here in the Brazos Valley. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so is Matt. My husband is Matt Chavaria. Right. And same, same as me. Just right. And, and, and I know the, I know the Chavarias mm -hmm. uh, very well. So. I know. You so had a, wanna, you coached wanna, some of them, right? Yeah, I want to send a shout out to the Chavarrias, yeah. and and they were big in in, uh, in baseball, and and they were a big impact in Little League West as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what my husband's doing right now. He's out practicing baseball okay. with my oldest son and uh, husband and children. So Matt, like I said, Matt Chavarria, he's a year older than me, but he won't tell you that. He won't. <laughs> 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 we met at Brian High actually. Um, he fell in love at first sight. It took me a little bit of time. I kid. I'm just kidding. Okay. No, um, no. We we met at Brian High. We have three kids. Our oldest is Nicholas. He's ten. Jesse, Josephine, she's seven, and five year old Zachary. Okay. And uh, where did you uh, go to elementary school? Well, I went to a lot of elementaries. So I went to Bonham, which is not too far from here. Right. Um, I went to Kemp. Gosh, Ben Milam, Sol Ross. Henderson, you should ask me where I didn't go. Okay. It's <laughs> well, pretty much we, we did the same thing because we started yeah. off at at, uh, at Ben Milam. No, we started off at Saul Ross. Okay. And then went to Ben Milam, mm -hmm. and then went to the Anson Jones and yep. the Lamars, and because back back in the day it was it was you know one school was the sixth grade and yep. one school was seventh grade. It's and way different now. So it's way different now. But yeah, I, my son is in fifth grade at um, Jane Long, and I was like, I was in Bonham right. when I was in fifth grade. That was still elementary. Right. And high school? Where did you attend high Brian school? High. Brian yeah. High. And I was um I was a Rayburn Raider for my middle school years. So Okay. Uh and you graduated in two thousand Oh god. Two thousand and four. <laughs> yeah. Um so right after high school, uh do you do you uh decide to go straight into college or did you take a couple of years off? No, I well, I started at Blinn. Um, okay. I started there and I, so when I was at Blinn, I kind of knew that I wanted to do something where I can serve the community. There were some times that I thought that I was I wanted to be a teacher because that's what my family came from. My mom was a teacher. Right. My sister had done that. She had done teaching uh, internships. So I, I was pretty confident that's what I wanted to do. In my mind, when you're giving back, like that's where that's where you go. You do that. You're a nurse. You're a doctor. Um but quickly, my family was like, yeah, you're you and the kids are not. That's not going to that's not going to work. You should probably be a lawyer. Right. Um, and uh, when when did you uh, decide to to make that that change in, in, in your education? Uh, so career? when I was younger, um, my mom actually helped me do an internship, get an internship with the 272nd District Court here locally. And so what I did that I would just go. um I was just watch court. And that's what I always encourage people to do right now. Sometimes you think that you know what you want to do until you're starting to do it or you're watching other people and you don't know what it entails. Right. And for me, I just would go up to the courtroom and I would watch. And I, was, I would watch the juvenile court too. So the thing about 272nd in our county is that we have dif di different district courts, but the juvenile is kind of connected to 272nd district court. So being an intern for both of those is kind of the way I looked at it. Sometimes I would go to juvenile. I was watching the way that they were, um, those cases went to court. Mm -hmm. Then I got to see the adults and I got to see how those cases went to court and went to trial. And it was just fascinating. You think that watching TV is fun? It's not as fun as being able to sit in court and watching that stuff live action. Now, mm -hmm. let me tell you this though too. 
it's also not the same because my mom watches Perry Mason and all those right. things. <laughs> and one time I invited her up to watch me and it was it was a big trial for me. I think it was I think it was like an aggravated robbery, something violent. And I had worked really hard on it and we got a good verdict at the end. But um, she I came back home. She lives with us now. She's older and she's recovering from cancer. And so I said, well, what'd you think? And she said, well. It was kind of boring. You're not really like Perry Mason. <laughs> <laughs> she thought it was just like a like a movie. Yeah, or, or and a so TV many show, people right? do. So many people do, right. but I it's do. just not right. <laughs> so it's hard for me. I don't watch a lot of those shows because you watch it and you're like, everybody looks so put together, right. and you're just glamorous, and there's no hiccups. But no, we stumble over our words sometimes, mm -hmm. and you're dealing with real life victims, real life witnesses. <clears throat> Police that are just trying to do the best that they can do with what they got. Right. And it is not scripted. You don't get to say cut when things don't go the way that you want them to no, go. They don't. You just, you got to keep on going. So mm -hmm. anyway, all that to say, um, what really started my love and my my decision was, what well, was a combination of things. It was that. And I was listening to um, a woman named Eva Guzman. And she is a, she was a Supreme Court justice, and she came to Brazos County, and she was a keynote speaker at the Hispanic Forum one year. And she's now actually, as Let, Let came to be, um, she's one of my mentors in my campaign right now. And so she's actually coming down on this Friday. She'll be here. Okay. And it's just, that's what you call full circle, right. is to be able to look at somebody and think, wow, they are inspiring. Right. And to carry on based on some of the things that you see them doing and then to have them as part in part as part of your life right. so a big part right now especially so so when you decide to to start uh, going into into law and, mm -hmm. or, or studying in college to go yeah. to law what 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 course did you take or what was the next step well it doesn't it it doesn't really work like that so I was at am right. when um when I finally decided I'd made that commitment that I want to go to law school. Um, but it was still a process because that's a big commitment. And you have to really be sure that even though in your mind and in your heart, that's what you think you want to do. You just, you better be sure. Cause it's a lot of money. It's a lot of time. I wanted to be here in the community and it was a little bit hard to see myself in that position. And it's one of the things that happens is, you know, we, I think we have a, an amazing community. We do. Yes. But when I grew up, I I wasn't the smartest kid in the room. I wasn't um, the richest kid or the best looking. And so you can kind of grow up not knowing that what you're able to achieve. You limit yourself. Mm -hmm. So that dream almost felt untouchable for me. Um, but then it just came a point in time when... So I just live my life like I just need to do the best that I can with what I have, where I am. And then God will lead me the rest of the All way. Right. So I can't tell you what the ultimate moment in time was or the next step. I just remember I was at a and I was interning for a law office here. And I got to see more, more trials and be involved in them. And I knew that that was the place for me. God, in, in my opinion, God switched my heart. Mm-hmm to match where um, my mind was, or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe he he had it in my heart, but then he had to prove to me in my mind, give me the confidence to know I can go forward and I can make something with this. Right. So that, that gave you kind of the confidence to to move forward mm -hmm. with, with, with what you wanted to do as, as, as a lawyer, right? Right. Uh, when the... I, I guess I guess when when do 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 you uh, decide to go full one hundred percent to become a lawyer? Because when you're in college, you can you can just switch. Yeah. Right. So and what, believe me. Right. What, I know what, that. Yeah. When, when did you decide to do to go ahead at one hundred percent and and get this done? I don't know what the I don't did, remember did, what. Did the... you just do it semester by semester and it kept take, taking courses and, and kept working? So my was, major was a, was communication. Okay. Um, and I did that because I actually like working with teams. And I like, I really do just love watching other people flourish. It's, I think that sometimes, especially when I work in, in the job that I have now, 
and some of my my mentors, you could see the there was a distinguishable difference between people who were training people up because they had to versus those who were training people up because they just got they just love watching other people do amazing things. And I saw that. And that is really where I really have that heart um, to watch other people grow. And so I was focusing when I was at AM on team management and team growth. And um, my major, my minor was, was English. So I just did, again, I just did what was best for me. And I try to follow my heart. Um, now, some of those things, they, they can kind of change, you know, as you're growing up and you're figuring yourself <clears throat> out. But at the end of the day, I just did what was good at that time, what was good and right for me. And I, I pray a lot about things, mm-hmm. a lot. Um, we can make decisions and we can make decisions um, prematurely in the flesh. Mm-hmm. And so I always revert back to, all right, well, you got to pray about it. You really have to pray about it. And sometimes it's talking to other people who have more experience. Um, that was... I remember that's what I did. Was I just wanted to make sure that so, so you this had was you right. had uh, you had mentors you, you went mm-hmm. to and, and who who were those those uh, people that that helped you along the way. So there were different people in the community that I talked to, but I always try to go back to the people in my family that that knew me the most. Um, they're your compass. The right. people who know you the most, your family, those are your your compass to guide you. It's easy to get lost sometimes. But I always try to go to people who are levels above me, mm-hmm. right? And they can be difficult to find, but I always surrounded myself with those people, and they're still my friends today. In fact, I was just talking to somebody on Facebook this morning who's known me uh, for a really long time, and she's just a powerhouse. And luckily, I've always been surrounded by powerhouse people. And it's not like I, I sought them out. They just happen. We just happen to have relationships. And so another that was just another blessing is being surrounded by those people that elevate you. Um, And those are the people that I would go to is I would just talk to them. And really, it was for me when I was watching trials, when I was watching what was happening in courtrooms, I wanted to just put my eyes on that and immerse myself in that as much as I possibly could. One of the things that I I always um, try to tell younger people is. When you're thinking about what you want to do, you can't just think about the highlights of that. You have to think about the some of the worst moments or the most difficult moments that you can imagine in that role. Because if those are things that you're willing to go through in order to fulfill whatever else it is that you want to do with that job, then you know that it's going to be okay. It's just like majors. People will say, well, I want to be a psychology major. Or whatever, whatever it is. Well, the highlights sound great, but there's some really difficult classes, and mm-hmm. you got to look at that. Are you willing to ha- Are you willing to take those too? Because it's part of it. So mm-hmm. that's the same for a career. Is you have to also think about the things that aren't glamorous. Yeah, being a, a trial lawyer, you think about the times that you're doing opening or closing. Every trial lawyer thinks about those moments in their mind. When I get up there in front of that jury and I do a closing argument and it feels so good to be able to look at a victim and say, I'm doing so I'm your voice or I'm doing something for you. But there are parts of it that aren't glamorous, that aren't easy. There are parts of it where you're working on the weekend or you're having to sacrifice family time or you're getting there very early. And that's part of it, too. And you have to do just as good of a job in those moments as you are in the moments that you find to be glamorous. You have to work on the cases that aren't as, um, we call them sexy cases, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have to work, <laughs> you know, cause that's what everybody right. likes. They like the, they like the drama or they like the murders or the, the violent stuff where you get to get in front of a jury and you do this amazing, you produce this amazing trial. Right. Okay. But what about those victims who are businesses? What about those people? Because they matter too. And it's not easy. It's not easy to track numbers. I didn't go to law school because I liked math. That's, I avoided anything that had to do with math. And right. so you also have to think about those people too, or the people that are having their cars broken into. Right. That's not, those don't get you cool press releases. It's not something that the community thinks, oh yeah, 
but those are victims. And so you have to always think about um, what you invest yourself in for your career. You have to go all in and be willing to do it no matter what, even if it's not the most glamorous part of it. So, mm. what, what was the most difficult case that you ever been involved in? Mm. Well, there are strategic, sorry, strategic difficulties, but I think the most emotional, the most emotional case that I was involved in. So I told you about my kids. Right. My youngest, his name is Zachary, and he's autistic, um, and. One of the most, emo and I, him being our youngest, um, it's kind of a shock when you learn that your child is autistic or, or anything for that matter. And um, it's real new and you don't know what to do and you don't know how you're going to handle it. And all you want is the best forever. You know how that is. You have kids. Mm -hmm. You just want the best for them. Right. Well, um, for Zachary, we had to put him through extensive extensive therapy. But in doing so, we learned as parents how best to give him the best life. Well, one of the most difficult cases I had was a young girl and she was 14 and she was autistic. And she had something very terrible happen to her. Um, and on first of all, those cases by themselves are difficult for kids mm -hmm. when they've been sexually abused or or they, there's something traumatic that happens in their life. Those are always going to be hard. But then you add to that the fact that this this young girl was autistic. And so she has sensory issues that, that made it also... So she has sensory issues. She had difficulty communicating fully, just like my Zachary. But it doesn't mean that he doesn't know or that he doesn't feel or that he's any less deserving Right. Um, and so it was a little bit difficult uh, getting her to communicate but and I'll never forget it was right after COVID so we were still having to wear face masks and um, that's also a, an, an issue for, just for normal people wearing the, fa the face mask do you remember right. it felt <laughs> it felt suffocating yeah, I, I hardly wore those yeah <laughs> it was terrible well she was being forced to wear it mm -hmm. and so you already have someone who has stimulation issues or sensory issues. And then you have this added. So she's scared naturally talking to strangers naturally. Um, that's going to make somebody anxious. And then you put a face mask on them. And then you add on all of those other barriers that just that are par part of um, what autism can do to any person. Yes. But she's young on right. top of that. So it was all of these issues that compounded on top of one another that made things hard for her. But um, I remember she was just, she was wearing a Selena shirt. Mm -hmm. And we were nervous that she wasn't going to communicate and that that was going to really have an impact, a negative impact on the overall case. But um, I just remember she was wearing a Selena shirt and we were asking her if she would, we, to put it, to summarize it, she wasn't wanting to communicate. We were having a really hard time getting her to talk, mm -hmm. period. Well, that Selena shirt helped me. And we walked her up to the courtroom, and it was Judge Hawthorne's courtroom. And um, we were able to just um, make her feel more comfortable. And prosecutors do that all the time. It's normal for prosecutors to just say, look, you're you're nervous or you're scared. Um, but I knew with her, I could see it. I knew with her, it was more so that it was just overwhelming. And so we took her up to that to that courtroom and just let her see. Because you also have to let those things develop naturally. Mm -hmm. They can't be forced. You can't coax them. And she was, at the end of all of that, she was able to communicate. Um, and she took her face mask off. And you just, when you see that, that little kid have courage, Right. And fight through her own um, impediments that she has. Right. It's a pretty awesome thing to see. Yes, yes. Um, as, as before we started, you mentioned that that I was a boxing coach, right? Yeah. And uh, I had this kid Xander who was autistic, yeah. and uh, he competed for one fight, and I got him to box, and he focused, and 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 I the reason I'm saying that because I kind of get what you're trying to say. Yeah. 
is that that you know it's it feels it feels good to get these kids to do what what they need to do. Yeah, you know, not not what we need them to do, but what they need to do for themselves. Right, and it, you know, a lot of times, and especially, you know, being a mom, um, each kid has their own little quirks right. or special needs for special attention for right. different reasons. A child who's autistic, they what what they're experiencing is just something that you can see more visibly, mm-hmm. and it's always been a real challenge because. For other disabilities, they're more they're more visible. And so it's easy to look at someone and say, well, that's clearly a disability. And so we're going to have to have extra compassion for them. Mm-hmm. But children who are who are autistic, what I've what I've seen a lot, at least with my son, is that it's not that easily visible. And so people automatically assume something else. Right. They right. automatically assume, well, they're just acting out or it's just bad behavior or they're just being difficult and they're not going to talk. They're not going to testify. No, that's not what it is. Just slow da- slow everything down. Mm-hmm. Take a little bit more time. Understand what's going on. Um, for me, that was difficult because I had to look at this at this child and and understand that um, she was hurt, and we were gonna we needed to put a little bit more extra attention, time, and care. Right. But justice, she has to be able to see justice like anybody else. Mm-hmm. Exactly. She's a victim too. Right. Um, I had a couple of, uh, I guess, student lawyers come into my podcast, yeah. Noe Mendoza and uh, Carlos Espina. Uh, he's pretty popular on TikTok, by the way. Is he? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think he, what, Alan, what did he say? He made like $1.3 million last year on TikTok. So, uh, and, and, and he just finished law school. Uh, oh, wow. So yeah, Where so, do you go? Las Vegas, uh, okay. University of Las Vegas. Right? That that was probably <laughs> that sounds like that was a fun time for him, huh? It, it probably was, uh, but uh, but what what uh, law school did you attend? South Texas, South that's in Houston. Texas, mm-hmm. in Houston. Yeah. And what drew you to that law school? So a few things. One is that they had a different type of entrance. A lot of times, um, law schools will their enrollment is only at very particular times, but South Texas allowed me to um, apply at a different time than other law schools. So when I finally decided and I'd gotten the courage, I was like, well, here we go. This is what we're going to do. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to apply. Um, and if the good Lord wants me there, he'll put me there. And so South Texas was also, they also had a partnership with Texas A&M. And so I'd seen that school. I'd seen the name a lot. Um, and there were lawyers here locally who had seen come from South Texas. Mm-hmm that are still practicing and their skill, their trial advocacy was just, um, they were trained in a way that set them apart visibly. Okay. You could see that they, they were doing things a little bit differently. Right. And I just loved watching the way that they presented cases. So it was a natural fit for me. South right. Texas well, was an easy fit for me to go. It was in Houston. So I was still able to be close. Um, I actually would wake up at four o'clock in the morning cause I wanted to live here. So I would just wake up at four, get in my car and go up there and, and then drive. drive back. Um, sometimes I would sleep in the parking garage where I would just study, but if gas prices are, <laughs> if they were the same, I would not be able to afford right. to do that. But, um, it was an easy fit and right. it was, they were actually, <laughs> they were very accommodating. The first semester of law school was, um, the time in our life where I was planning our wedding, my husband and I in my wedding and the first, the first, um, law school exam. So it's weird law school. You don't have exams throughout the course of the class. You have one test and that's it. Whatever you make is what you make. Well, that first test was scheduled at the same time as our, um, rehearsal dinner at La Botana. That's where we had it. (laughs) And so I I was like, well, let me see. I don't know. It's at the same time. It's going to be weird if they have a rehearsal dinner without me. So I went up to the school and I was like, well, the, the least I can do is ask them. If they say no, they say no, right? So sure enough, I, I talked to them and I said, look, I am I have my rehearsal dinner. Is there any way that I might be able to take the exam earlier? And they said, yeah. They said, yeah, we just have to make sure that you have a proctor that is standing there with you. And I was like, okay. And they said, we're going to have you in a special room, secluded. They, didn't, they wanted to make sure that when I finished the exam, it wasn't at a time that I could 
give answers to anybody else. So they just separated me. Well, what I didn't know was that their special room was going to be a little um, electrical closet on the second floor. <laughs> so my first law school exam, I was in an, elect an electrical closet with a poor proctor standing on the outside. Um, and I don't, I don't remember what, I think I made a B or something on that, on that law school exam. But then I just rushed back home, got in my car, got dressed and made it to my rehearsal dinner. Right. And it was a lot of fun. So what was your experience like at, at, at law school? As far as how many years is it? Two? No, it's three. Three years? It's three. What was yeah. your experience like? Well, was, it's a was, roller was there, coaster. Was, yeah, was there a lot of students like fighting for positions or, or I think that like was that, happening. Right? I think it was happening, but because I told you I lived at home still. Right. Um, I was just focused on that. I would just get in my car, go. The moment classes were over, I'd get back in my car, come back home. But I, I do there was I think I do think there think there was a lot of infighting between yeah. everybody fighting for spots. Right. I just wanted to go in there and do a good job. Right. And everybody else and all the drama surrounding it, you would hear it, but it's kind of like high school. Like just focus on you and do a good job. Right. So so uh, currently what, what kind of law do you practice? So I'm a public defender. That means I do defense work. Okay. Well, let's, let's get to, to the reason why you're here. Yeah. Okay. You, you're uh, running for district attorney for Brazos County. Yes. Okay. What, uh, what made you want to uh, run for office? Because this, this is an elected position. It right? is elected, yeah. Uh, what qualities do you think? Well, first tell me why, uh, why, why you, you chose to, to run for office. Well, let me tell you this. I never in a million years thought that I would ever run for an office. Um, I go, when I went to law school, you were asking about it. There are people there who know I want to be an elected official. I want to be an elected DA. I never had that dream in my heart. All I ever wanted to do was I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor from my intern, my um, internship experiences. But I also knew that, and my mom, she always taught me, Whatever you're going to do, you you need to leave this community better because they gave you a lot. And I've given the community a lot, and I want you to do that, whatever you choose to do. So my goal was never to run. My goal was always to give back, always to serve victims. The, the thing is, there's a lot of people here that um, they just need people to stand up for them. And I even did that when I was in school. That's how people knew, even before I did, that I needed to be a lawyer. Um, that's just who I am naturally. I see somebody hurting somebody else. I see someone doing something wrong to someone else. I was always, I was getting in trouble at school for defending other people. Um, and I would have never changed that about myself. Okay. You got to take arrows for that <clears throat> sometimes. Right. But right. Um, as far as running for office, what happened was um, I was... There are things that I saw happening. And I think that when you have such a deep connection to the community and you have such a deep desire to help at any cost, those things start to affect you in a way that changes your, your heart and it changes your mind. Mm. And so that had been happening. And I still worked as hard as I possibly could. And those things were externally taking place around me or I would see them in passing. Um, and sometimes they had a direct effect on the way that I was able to prosecute a case. And the best way I can say is um, I came from an office where I, even when I left to the public defender's office, we were really good friends. But I think that we all had, we all had experiences where it was hard. It was hard to see the look in victims' eyes. And then it was um, it was law enforcement. Okay. It was law enforcement when I realized that they were um, feeling and being treated disrespectfully or like they didn't matter. Their voices weren't being listened to. And um, that can happen sometimes. But that I never thought that would happen in our community, not with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. There were times that I'd seen that happen with victims. And that hurt. Um, it hurts to see that, especially when you're when the oath that you take and the commitment to the, your community is so strong. Mm -hmm. That that was that was really hard for me. 
but then when I also found out that it was happening to law enforcement. Expl- okay. Explain to me what, what's going on with the law enforcement. What, what, sure. What the what the. You know, you have to work or... really closely with law enforcement and what you do as a prosecutor. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that, uh, and you, it, what's really vital is that you have a good working relationship, not just with them, but all the other agencies. Right. Because what you do as a prosecutor, you don't ever do it by yourself. You really rely on those other agencies within the community. Um, there are experts. I've never gone to, um, I've never been through police training, police academy. I've never been an expert in the field working with victims. Those are your experts. Those are the people. We have different agencies, unbound, amazing agencies that are just set out. Their their only focus is to help people. And so where I am an expert is in in my field, right, and being a prosecutor or now a defense attorney. My expertise comes in the practice of criminal law and applying whatever it is that's taken place in the case in the courtroom. But to think that I would do it by myself is very naive. And so um, when law enforcement, when they are being ignored or not communicated with, that can really affect the case, the strength of your case. And in turn, the only person that really affects are the victims, right. which then goes back out to the community. Um, and so that's the reason why right now in this campaign, I have a lot of active law enforcement who are supporting me. Right. And they're not just supporting me because I am I'm champ I'm their champion, right? They're they're all very realistic and logical. And um we have I don't know if you know our long-term JPs, Kenny Elliott, Jeff Reeves, people who have just invested their entire life and soul to giving back to this community. Detectives who have been here for decades. They've all had those same experiences. And my treasurer right now is Judge Travis Bryan. Are you familiar with who he is? No, no. Well, he was a district court judge, and he was there for a really long time. Um, and independently, we both talk to law enforcement. And we, we listened to them. We researched some of the stuff that they were talking about. And... Um, we realized that this was a problem that had to be fixed and it was going to have to be fixed from somebody stepping up and willing to take on this, this fight and doing it. And it's not easy. Nobody wants to, nobody really wants to run a campaign or, or fight someone who has been in office for so long. But my mom always said, look, if you are in a position where you can fix something and you know that there's a problem and you do nothing, well, you're worse than the person that created it. Right. So I knew that this was going to be, um, I knew it was going to be a ride, a rough ride, but that can't stop us. No. The right. community needs to have those those voices for right. them. So uh, what qualities do you think a district attorney should have? There's a lot of them, but I think most, most importantly, listening to the community. Okay. How would you describe your management style? So it, it depends. You can't really have one. It you know it reminds me of raising kids. You know how you have you have two boys, right? Right. Okay. Well, I have three, and um, are both of your boys the same? Like, do they have the same personalities? Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I don't. My mom never really spanked us, but I think that if she did, I would probably be the one that got spanked the most. <laughs> but the thing is, is that every. My management style depends on the needs of the person that I'm helping. Right. And so it's just like with kids. Right. One of them, I can, my oldest in the morning, I just say, hey, get up. You need to go get ready for school. And boom, he takes care of everything. Right. The you, other you one. You need to adjust to, to the situation. Right. 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 The other one, it, the other ones, I'm like, well, I got to really micromanage you to help you get to that point. So my management style really depends. Now, um, I love actively helping people. The, the, the truth of the matter is this, especially with lawyers, most young ones, they have an idea in their mind. Just like when you're watching TV, you have an idea of what it should look like, but the application of it is so different. It's even the easiest thing, standing up and making an objection. Sometimes it just makes them nervous to be able to do that. So right. you have to just stand there and sometimes just coach them. You're really a coach for those. But then older ones, people who have experience, back up. You just need to back up and and let them do their thing. And then you can give them an opportunity 
to grow through criticisms or critiques, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, But even that, you can even learn how to be a better manager. I had to take, I still take management classes. Even though my foundation was in team, team management, what I learned is that every single year you're growing and every single year there's something else that you can possibly learn to make yourself better. Right. What are the most pressing issues pressing issues you see for the DA office you are seeking? So I think that there are some issues that that, that were concerns that, that there are now. I think that there are st- structural or systemic um, inefficiencies that can that need to be fixed. Um, it you know the DA's office has a lot of employees, a lot of different people doing different things. When I was there. I had, we, and every single prosecutor has huge caseloads. Well, what I had to learn when I left, what I learned that um, something that we were all missing is how to manage such a huge, huge caseload. The way it works a lot of times is it's just like you walk into the office. Well, what's going on that day? What fire do you need to put out? What trial is coming up? And that's not really a a long-term way that you can manage cases. You have to be able to have a system in place to prioritize, triage, have a plan. And those are things that are, you. it's capable of happening. You just have to put that that time into it. Um, And you have to have someone who is is pretty present to oversee those kind of things Um, or invest in the training or see the need for it or see that there's a, Be so present in the office that when you're looking at things, you can identify where there's a gap. Because you're when you're in the DA's office, when you're an elected, you have to you have a lot of people to manage. And even the best prosecutors still that one of the jokes is, well, lawyers are terrible at at management. They're great at prosecuting or, you know, they're great at um, being in trial, Mm -hmm. presenting cases, but they are terrible managers. And that's true. That's not what they teach you in law school, but you have to take those that training by yourself. And luckily, um, there's a lot of free things out there. And so you have to really invest yourself in always growing, always learning, and making sure that your team that you have has the resources too, and that you're helping them and you're there to be available whenever they have something that's going wrong. All right. So what are, what are your goals uh, for the office? Well... Primarily, um, I want to rebuild some of the relationships that have been broken with law enforcement, especially. But also, there's a big issue with transparency. We have um, we have a lot of a lot of diverse people in this community. But what I've noticed is that everybody knows how to use certain um, resources. The Internet is one of them. Right. Right. And so when we're talking about victims, especially, there's a lot of people who have come across, um, they've come across me and my, my other volunteers, block walkers. And the heartbreak that they've seen is actually more than I've, I was aware of, to be completely honest with you. When you're a prosecutor, you have a, you have a pretty good grasp of your cases and you see things in passing that you would have never seen before, um, but that's still a small portion of what is actually going on. And so the more that I speak to people, the more I realize that this was a much larger issue than I could have ever imagined. Right. And so one of the things that we have to do is be transparent to the, for the community. Without that, there's no way to be accountable for them. And as a prosecutor, you take, you take an, uh, an oath to see that justice is done. And... That often means that your victims need to feel and see justice. It starts from the beginning, though. A lot of times they just want to know what's going on with their case. Um, And one of the ways that you can do that and one of the plans that I have is you just got to put something up on the Internet. All you need is a website. All you need is something that says, and we have resources for that. A lot of offices actually do that. There's portals that you can speak to, uh, you can go to to speak to uh, an advocate there, a liaison. Um, There's ways that you can check on case statuses. But 
that is what we're doing this for. We're doing this for victims. That is the the point and and why we have victim assistant coordinators. Their ultimate goal is to make sure that there's a liaison for those victims. And if the victims don't have a way to communicate, a way to understand what's going on, a way to understand the system, then in that itself, they can start to feel like there's not justice. You know, I don't want people to feel like like our justice system is broken. Some of the things that some of the ways that we can fix that are really simple. People just want to know and it's confusing. I talk to people about what I do all the time and people are confused. They don't know what what a probable cause statement is <laughs> or reasonable suspicion. <laughs> what is the difference between the standards of proof and so or the burdens of proof? And especially in jury selection, you start to realize, wow, legal jargon is very confusing. And so can you imagine being a victim who's already been hurt? You have no clue what's going to go on. You don't understand what's happening. And you just want to be kept informed. Well, one of the easy things to do for transparency for victims in the community is to have that up on the Internet. And I don't mean that you have to issue press releases for everything. That's not necessarily the way that other um, departments do it. Press releases are fine, but what press releases don't tell you are um, who's the person over your case? Who should you talk to? Press releases don't tell the community, well, what happened in this case that wasn't so um, worthy of being highlighted? Press releases, the only, the only real good thing press releases do is tell the community Look at how good this verdict is, right? That's what press releases do. Um, or the press releases that are coming from our local DA's office. Mm -hmm. They talk about the highlights. <clears throat> well, okay, but what about the other things that are happening? Because our community deserves to know that too. And it's not like you have to issue those all out on a press release, but you can, you can have that information um, on a website so long as you're hiding some of the confidential information that needs to be hidden. But... DA's offices across the state, they have portals. They have the ability to make that easy to access for other victims, witnesses, the community. It's easy to make that happen. Right. So uh, explain to everybody what, what what is the DA's primary role? What is the district attorney's primary role? Well, there's an oath that we take, and it's to see that justice is done. And that means different things. Um, but primarily it means this, <clears throat> that whether— whether you have a situation where you're looking at it and you say, you know, there's not enough here. Um, I'm going to have to dismiss this. Or this is a difficult case, but we believe the victim. And we're going to fight hard to make sure that we do right. Not just for the, and this could be taken out of context, but not just for the victim's sake, but for the community's sake. Because the community has to know, and they do, they look at those things. They look at verdicts. They hear verdicts. People talk. This right. is a small community. Um, justice means that you do, sometimes you dismiss because it wasn't done correctly and you talk to law enforcement. Or sometimes you go in and you roll up your sleeves and you're able to look at a victim and say, I believe you and we're going to work our hardest at this. And sometimes it means a plea. Um, but... What it doesn't mean is you only convict when it's convenient. Justice is absolutely not a scorecard. So you have to make sure that you're getting in there, you're rolling up your sleeves, and you're paying attention to the cases in front of you. And these people aren't just on a piece of paper. They represent lives. They're mothers. They're fathers. They're business owners. And that's the other thing. Justice is, there's a phrase, and it says, no one is above or below the law. And that includes business owners. And that's a that's a big deal for me. Growing up here, um, and you talk, you owned a bit uh, boxing. Right, I right? a boxing club, yes. This community is built by people who just have a hope and a dream and two pennies to rub together. Mm -hmm. And then they build something amazing. So when they're stolen from, they are affected in a way that a lot of people can't really understand. Because they're not like the victim that the victims that you normally see. They're not a person who's been cut or bruised or beaten. But their soul has. Their spirit has. Their willingness to want to continue to do. These businesses do good for us. How many people did you have at your, in your boxing club? 
Mm, yeah, there was at least 50 members at all times. At all know. times. And yeah. you... That's talk, 100 parents. Yeah. <laughs> and so then you have the, the these young kids who have special needs that you're yeah. they are able to help. Right. But when that's destroyed by people who you trust to run it, and that's happened a lot. There are a lot of business owners who have talked to me about them being turned away. And let me tell you, it is not fun to try those cases. What, ta- what type of cases are, 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 are those that, that a business uh, has issues? So there's different kinds. Sometimes the easier ones usually are to prove are credit card cases, right? Because somebody's ran mm. a credit card that doesn't belong to them. Okay. Those are easier to prove. And oftentimes there's video. Um, but the ones that are hard, it's when you have someone who's within your office and they have a role that that you, where you trust them and they're overseeing your accounts and the bills that need to be paid. And slowly but surely, they're stealing money and thousands of dollars. And over the course of time, they've stolen tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. But even in a world where they only stole a few hundred, all of that matters. Right. Because what that does, the problem is that when those cases aren't being prosecuted, most of the time, the people that are able to get away with that, they're pretty good at what they do. They're pretty good at conning people. They've already established trust with an owner of a business. Mm-hmm. And nobody even sees that money is being stolen right out from underneath their nose. So when those cases aren't being prosecuted or they take a long time to be prosecuted, that person is going to another job where they're doing it again to somebody else and to somebody else until they're held accountable. And so a big issue that we're having... you know, is that these businesses have to see the people who have hurt them and hurt their business and destroyed their trust just mm. walk around for years without accountability and sometimes never, ever have accountability. One of the people I spoke to, um, they told me, well, this person stole a lot of money and they weren't held accountable. And then they left and they did it again. And then they did it again. So now there's three businesses that have been um, victimized. Right. But then not only that, then they're victimized again when they're looked at and told, sorry, we're not, we, we're not or we can't help you. Mm-hmm. That is not justice right. for them. Right. Uh, let me ask uh, something about you. Yeah. What civic organization or nonprofits profits have you been an active member of? Well, a lot. Currently, I focus on doing stuff with the kids or just doing things unofficially. So one of the things that I identified or, uh, you know, earlier in the year, my oldest son, he, I asked him what a vape pen was. Do you know what a vape pen yeah, is? I, okay. I busted a few kids at the club. with. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's the thing is that these kids have those all the time right. and they don't even know what's going on. They have no clue that, that this stuff is um, illegal. It could get them in trouble at school. They just see it as some kind of cool thing that it says it tastes like cotton candy mm-hmm. or watermelon or strawberry, whatever. Pick your flavor. So I was at home and my son came up. He had his two best friends there. They're twin brothers. And I asked them, I said, uh, I call him Nico, but his name is Nicholas. I said, look at this. And I didn't tell him what it was. Um, and I said, tell me what you would do if Somebody at school told you to hold that or or they told, told you to taste it because it tasted like strawberry. And he said, mm, and I, I just said, OK, that's enough. In that pause, immediately I realized. If my child doesn't know that that's wrong, my kid, I was, you know, gang prosecutor. I prosecuted people for drugs. I prosecuted even juveniles when they would have stuff at school like that. If my own kid doesn't know immediately how to respond to that, how many other kids don't know? So when we talk about different things that I'm doing, I do, I try to do stuff where I know that I'm giving back to the community, however I'm doing that. Um, So I go to the different schools or different organizations, whoever will let me talk. And I'm just trying to inform them. I really do believe that one of the best preventions for kids getting in trouble is just to tell them or parents. You know, there's a thing called fentanyl. I don't know if you've heard that. Yes, I've heard of that. And it's so dangerous. It, right. It's, it's it's dubbed the one kill pill. Right. It's an epidemic. It's right an now, epidemic. Right. And there are people who 
their appearance. You don't even know what that is. They don't know what it looks like. If they saw it sitting on their counter, they would have no clue. So we have to get in, back into the community and educate kids, educate parents, and make sure that everybody knows what's going on. Because when you do that and you tell these kids, hey, this is this could get you in trouble, then the benefit of that is a lot of times they'll be able to make better choices. And the same is true for Aggies. I can't tell you how many times I'm looking at the news and I'm like, here goes our new recruits again, getting arrested. Right. You know what I mean? And right. it's so frustrating. <clears throat> right. um, it, well, it's frustrating because you're looking at them and you're like, you got to make better choices. Like you you came all the way to a and you have, you have a position on a team that uh, people would die to have. And, and, a, very, you and a very expensive school. Very <laughs> expensive. To ruin it for, for this? Right. Well, you know, the other thing is that I don't think people realize we have recruiters at Texas A&M who are paid to go recruit people, students, from um, different areas of the United States. Mm -hmm. So we're actively bringing them back into our community. And then you add you add to the fact that they're kids. Right. Well, I call them kids. They're like 19. And they think like a kid a lot of times. But we have the opportunity in our own university to go into their, those schools, new student conference, fish camp, mm -hmm. athlete orientation. You have the opportunity to go in there and say, guys, look, I know that where you came from, it was treated differently. Or maybe you think that even though it was illegal, you just got a slap on the wrist, but that's not what's going to happen to you here. And when you have somebody in authority, like someone from the DA's office, talking to them about that and educating them, that that starts the prevention process. That starts them having the information to know, I have to make a choice here. Am I going to do this and possibly lose all of these things? Or am I going to make a better choice and hopefully keep the strength of our football team together? <laughs> So uh, what distinguishes you from the other candidate? So I think that primarily it's I'm board certified in criminal law, which means that I have a lot of training, a lot of um, continuing education. And I'm the only candidate who's actively been in trial in five and a half years. And that when you combine those things, it allows me to have a very um, good understanding of what is what's set to take place in a trial um how to handle those things how to train people how to process cases what to offer on pleas and it also makes me really strong when i'm having to say to somebody this is the offer i'm going to make this is what this case is worth i know what it's worth because i've lived i've lived the life of rolling up my sleeves and getting into right. the trenches the experience it's the experience and and i talk to juries after mm -hmm. trial and they tell you um look you got a guilty we we believed it beyond a reasonable doubt but these are things that you can work on and some of those things you know people ask you after trial well what did the jury say sometimes it's not even just what they say it's the way they looked or the way they they acted or mm -hmm. different different nuances that you miss unless you're actively in trial and so you combine all of those things with the fact that I'm constantly seeking out opportunities to be in the community. Right. Why are you, why are you the best person for the job? For those reasons. For those reasons. For those reasons. For but the experience. It's not just that though. I think that being in the community, um, when you're listening to what is actually going on, you're able to identify different things that are happening that you would otherwise have no idea, right? right? How it's how can you? Um, provide and see that justice is done for a community that you're not aware of, that you have little contact with. The things that I do when I was telling you, when I was contacting different organizations or when they're letting me speak, um, and that's not all I do. I, I did other things too, but you start to realize that there are needs that the community has that you, you really need to be addressing and you can address those within the office. Some of them, like I told you, they're victims that just are just heartbroken or they don't understand what's going on. Well, when you have those people, those conversations, and you have their suggestions to you, or you just hear their complaints, you can actually take those and utilize them to employ practices to fix th those problems. So 
well, let's say that a victim is upset because she hasn't really understood that it's going to take a few months for her to ever go to court. Well, guess what? That's that's the natural course of the mm-hmm. way things happen. So on the front end, when they have a good understanding, really expectations is a thing. Just manage those expectations with people. Communicate with them. Mm-hmm. And maybe in your mind, you are doing that. But that's why it's so important that you get into the community because then there's a disconnect. In your mind, when you think something is happening and the reality is that it's not effective or it's not happening, we'll just tweak that. Figure out what is the problem and how can I fix that? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes people are going to be upset and they're not going to be happy. You can't make everybody happy. But what you can do is then at least go back and communicate with that. Communicate that to them. Tell us uh, why we should vote for Maritza. I have uh, two boys that are going to vote for the first time. Yeah. Right. Tell them why we should vote for Maritza. (laughs) Well, here's why. There is a community that raised me, and it gave me everything it could to put me in a place where I could give back to it. And that's exactly what I'm doing, is that I have heard the, I have heard the call out for help, and I'm answering that. But it's not just that. It's that I do have the experience and the ability to get in there if I have to by myself to even try those cases. But the beauty is that I don't, I don't have to do it by myself. And I, um, I recognize that there are experts within the community that I could go to. I am not so naive to believe that I can possibly do everything on my own. But what that's done is it's made me stronger because I can seek out the people that are stronger and smarter than me. And I do all of those things, not for myself. And it's not for you either. And it's not for each individual voter. It's for the community at large. The things that, the things that I've ever done in my life, being board certified or um, trying these hard cases, it's not because I, nece- I wanted anything for myself. Everything that I've ever done, every, anything that I've ever achieved, has always been because I see that as a way to make me stronger for the people that I've sworn to protect. Even in my current job, I don't do what I do for anybody else except for the people who I have dedicated my life to to protect and to serve, and that's the community. Whatever role that I'm going to serve in, I will always put the community first. And what people need from an elected is someone who is present and who is putting the community's needs first. But the only way you can even possibly put the community's needs first is if we, is if you know what those are. Right. Is this the first time you are running for a political office? Yeah. Do you, I, do you have any previous experience? Running? Absolutely not. No. I don't. <laughs> I've never wanted to be a politician. I I'm. I don't think I'm a good politician at all. Um, but I try to tell the truth, and sometimes even now. You know, sometimes I stumble over my own words or I'm thinking to myself, well, what is the answer for that? Because it can be so global. And sometimes even the person asking the question can, you're thinking, well, what are you really wanting me to to say? Well, I'm not a politician, so I'm just going to answer it the best that I can. Um, And no, I don't have any training in politics. I've never studied that. Uh, This is the first time that I've ever done anything like that. And I'll tell you what. I do. I did volunteer for other people. Um, block walking was always so much fun. When you do, you know what that is? When you knock on the doors, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was always fun right. until you have to do it for yourself <clears throat> because then you have to talk about yourself, and it's awkward. I don't like to talk about myself, right. but um, all of those things I think is so important because what this experience is showing me is that um, everybody needs to go through it. It's right. hard. It's exhausting. You get home tired. But this is so important because when you do this, you start to remember the work that it takes to get a vote. And when you do that and you're in that office and everything that you do, you're reminded of the people that put you there. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I've never done politics before outside of me helping other people. But this has been an amazing experience because now I realize that when the people vote you in, 
you better have put in some work to get there. Mm. You Nobody should ever just be handed a spot ever. I think that what ends up happening is that you can grow complacent. Mm -hmm. You can forget, you can forget real easily um, what it takes and what it means to be in an elected position. Right. What endorsements have you received? So, um, honestly, the endorsements that I think are the most important are the ones I just told you about. It's the business community who says, Maritza, we need you. Right. It's the victims who haven't seen justice for a long time or they feel like justice doesn't exist for them or the parents who have to see the brokenheartedness in their child or law enforcement who feel like without a change that they're, they're going to be exhausted. Those are my favorite endorsements because those are the ones that matter to the most to me because those are the ones that are real. They represent the community. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Right. But the other like official endorsements have been um, Justice Guzman, Eva Guzman, um, conservative Hispanias in action. And, you know, I've never had a, I've never had to go through an endorsement process, but what I'll tell you is this. I feel like for the first time I know what it feels like to be interrogated because <laughs> they are not easy. They, they, you interview and they have all of these questions and they do all of this research and it's very humbling no. when they come back and say, we've decided that we are going to endorse you because I know that it's not something they just stamped on you. It's no. something that they really invested their time to do. So what is something interesting about Maritza that's not on your resume? Remember when I was talking about that little girl mm -hmm. with the Selena shirt? Right. I've always wondered what it would have been like if I could have just been Selena. <laughs> <laughs> You, you and every Hispanic. Girl. Right? Oh, my goodness. And I I absolutely think that I can sing like her, but then I hear a recording and I realize I can't. Right. No, but honestly, one of my favorite things to do outside of the law, because the law is actually very fun. Mm -hmm. People ask me all the time, what's your hobby? And I don't have one. I really don't. Um, studying the law is fun to me. But then I have my babies, my kids. And so whatever it is that they're doing... That's what I do. Um, and one of the things that I really enjoy doing is the baseball DJ okay. for my son. Oh, okay. So I get to control their music. Oh, I see. So you strike out, music <laughs> off, right? You do a good job, right. you get to change your walk-up song okay. at the last minute if, if you want to. Wow. What's your song? What's your son's uh, walk-up song? Oh, he so he changes his. Um, one of them is we call it. He, well, we don't call him this, but his coaches were, were calling him Nico Suave. Oh, okay. And so there's a song that has that in it. Um, there's, what what was the other one that he had? Panic at the Disco. But he, it's a funny story about music, though. Um, and it's what I use, too, when I'm training other people. When you get up to the, to the plate and you're thinking about what not to do, that's what overtakes your body. So you get up to the plate and you're thinking... Don't strike out. I can't strike out. All your body does is think, oh, my gosh, I'm going to strike out. Right. right. And so I love the music because that let, that lets those boys listen to music instead of um, thinking about those other things right. and releasing. Right. They release stress and you get up there and you do the best you can with what you got. Right. And that's what people have to do when they're in court. That's what you have to do with anything. You right. have to trust yourself. You put in the work. That's that's where the work comes in. Mm -hmm. You put in the work and you know that based on what you've done and the preparation that you've done, you're going to be OK and let everything else go. And you get in there and you make those arguments or you do whatever you're doing to the best of your ability. Then that's all people can ask for. Right. Uh, favorite lawyer movie. I told you I don't like those. I don't like those. I don't like yeah, to watch there's, lawyer there's TV. There's a bunch of good movies. A Few Good Men. No, it's, it's actually Rainmaker. it's actually my uh, cousin Vinny, and it's because it really is my and favorite all time comedy. Really? Yeah. Well, it's because that there was a moment in that movie where um, the the lawyer took this just woman who mm -hmm. worked on vehicles. Right. And he made her, boom, made her an expert. Right. And that, you can you can actually do that. Really? You can actually oh, wow. you can actually use people in the community. And that's what I mean. 
lawyers shouldn't act like, prosecutors shouldn't act like, defense attorneys shouldn't act like they know everything because we don't. Mm -hmm. the, the true experts, the, the way that you actually do the best job is when you lean on those other people in the community. You lean on your doctors and your nurses. You lean on your law enforcement. You lean on the other agencies. You lean on people, right? right? right. And so that's what I love about this job is that I get to talk to and work with everybody in the community. Right. Um, and just like her, well, I've never had to make a person an expert on vehicles the way he did with her, but, right. you know, yeah. <laughs> time will only, funny time movie. Will only tell. It's real funny. Movie. Yeah. I think that's one of the most I've laughed in a movie theater. What was your favorite part in that movie? Uh, when the other lawyer started stuttering, <laughs> that made me laugh a lot. So that's that, that just got to me. I don't know why. Well, we actually use that, too, to talk to juries because there's, there's a part in there where, um, well, two parts. Do you remember when... He's like, who shot the clerk? Right. Do you remember that? Right. And he's like, or they ask him, you, you shot the clerk? And he says, I shot the clerk. Right. The way that they took that out of context, that's funny. Right. And then the other part is when they're doing jury selection, and he's like, what would you do to the woman on the on the jury panel? Do mm -hmm. you remember what I'm talking right, about? Right, I know, I know the whole thing. And movie, he's like, so. yeah, <laughs> she'll do. Yeah, that's not how that happens. Right. You do not get selected for jury that right. way. Well, I, actually, uh, I've been... Uh, Called up for jury duty maybe four times a year for the past 10 years. Really? So if you know anybody out there <laughs> that can just stop that. <laughs> well, why? What cases are you getting called on? Uh, it's everything. Have it's, you had to sit on the panel? Uh, twice. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, what, twice. what kind of cases were they for? It was uh, popping fireworks and speeding. Oh, well, those yeah, aren't. Those. Those but, aren't but, those aren't uh, the sexy ones like we right. were talking about but, earlier. But the ones that haven't been selected were were actually real crimes. Okay. You know, so were you sitting closer to the back? Uh, I'll always sit in the middle because of the L Longoria. Okay. Well, so. it sometimes it works like that, but usually it's just you know a matter of random a seat assignment. Right. But yeah, yeah, that's. Right. Uh, and I always get to ask questions and I always have to answer oh, and, and you, okay and uh, maybe. Four times I've been where a friend of mine's on trial. Oh, <laughs> so I get well, out. Well, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> but well, uh, well, what's your favorite experience in a jury? Uh, it was just listening and, and listening to the lawyers and, and hearing the case. Uh, some some of these are very intriguing, uh, interesting, and, and I just wonder how how they end up here. You know, the lawyers or the crime. The crime. Really? Yeah. I mean. What you know? It's it's people don't realize how 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 many different crimes are are out there. Yeah, not just murder and stealing. Yeah, that's know? right. So it, it was always interesting to hear the lawyers talk, and you know just the experience. Did you know? know that that's one of the most important parts of a jury trial is that jury selection process? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, it's very important. Yeah, yeah. well, and you're not there's so many things you're not allowed to do in jury selection. You're not allowed to tell people the facts of the particular case. So right. people get mad and you're like, I'm sorry, this is just the way that the law is. Right. Yeah, they're always telling stories that, that that didn't pertain to the crime, but we could figure out what they uh, were yeah? trying to say. <laughs> yeah, tell me about one that you remember like that. Uh, I think the last one, uh, it has something to do with, and, and I don't know because I was selected, yeah. but... Uh, they kept talking about, you know, what if a, a police officer pulled you over? And, and I, just, I, I can't remember exactly, but it, 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 we figured out it had nothing to do with that, mm -hmm. but it had something to do with, with something else. So, yeah. So it was it was pretty pretty interesting and yeah, funny people, at the same time. <laughs> well, people get mad sometimes, uh, and, you know, you're restricted by the law, and right. the law is what the law is. and um, But, no, that's one of the most important parts of yeah. jury or of a jury trial is right. that part right there. So, Marisa, what, what do you want to add to the podcast before you go? What would you like to tell the uh, the people in our community? That I hope that they get out and they use their voice and they actually vote. It's important to vote. It's so important. And the fact of the matter is this. It's very difficult to to take on an incumbent. Um, and that's why for so long the incumbent ran unopposed. It doesn't mean that there was nothing happening that that the community wanted to fix. It just it was just that nobody was taking up that challenge. Right. And I understand why living through it, I get it. 
It's not something that's fun. I, I For the life of me, I don't know how there are some people who just stay in politics. You know what I mean? You, you seem to see their name every single time right. some kind of election is coming around. I don't know how they live like that. But this is important. And so I can do the work that I'm doing and I'm working really hard and I have a great team. But all of that means absolutely nothing. Nothing if people don't get out and vote. Right. And I grew up here. I knew that there were times that you wonder, well, I'm just one person. What if I miss? I'll tell you what you miss. Every vote is going to be a number on a television screen on March 5th. Every vote is going to be someone who says, I want different. I want something better for my community. I want something better for victims. I want something better for law enforcement, those men and women who actively are on our streets during the holidays, during birthdays, during family functions. They have they have vowed to protect our streets even when it's not fun or convenient or timely for them. Mm -hmm. So every single vote, every single number that comes up on that screen sends a message out to people. And that message is, I'm here. And so if you feel something in your heart, if you think that um, things need to change, it doesn't matter what work I do. It doesn't matter what work my team does. It doesn't matter. None of that matters if you don't if you don't cast your, your right. vote. And right. some people will say, well, it's really hard to beat an incumbent. Um, but can I just say that there's a lot of community support that I wasn't even expecting. I was not expecting the amount of people who have come out who have supported me, who recognize that we need a, a change for the better. Right. And so I say this. In that time, in that, in the time when somebody is deciding whether or not they're going to come out or whether or not it matters, my question is, well, does this community matter to you? Because that's why I'm doing this. Yeah. I'm doing it for the community. And so we've lost there have been people who have lost elections by less than five votes right. here locally. It matters. It actually matters. Right. It matters. And just because you're not somebody that's affected, one of my favorite quotes is this, justice is only truly served when those who are unaffected are just as outraged as those who are. And so just because you haven't heard or just because you haven't lived that life or just because you don't, um, you don't feel what other people feel. Get out there and cast your vote. And I'm not even saying just cast it for me. Mm -hmm. If you want to go up there and say, I'm going to vote for the person who's currently in office, well, that's also a vote for, for me to see. That's a number for me to see, that they know what's going on. And they said, I made my choice and my choice isn't you. Guess what? Just like in a jury trial, I'm going to present all the, the evidence. And what you do with that at the end of the day what the community does, I'm going to honor that. As long as I know that it was based on having information. Correct. One of, one of the things that's difficult for me is understanding, as I'm talking to different people, that they've already made a choice without knowing what's going on. And that's not the way to vote. You don't vote based on, um, and that's even for me. I wouldn't want somebody to just vote for me based on the fact that, um, they knew a friend and they like me. Right. I want you to vote based on what you know is needed for this community. Whatever that vote is, I will honor that because you're a community member and I honor the people in this community. Right. But if you if you're not looking at the issues, if you're not using your voice, that's when something like an injustice is going to happen. So I encourage people to to just get out there. Encourage your friends to get out there. Right. Uh, February 20th is is um, early voting, and that's when people need to do it. Because come March 5th, when you have one shot to do it, you don't know what's going to happen. You have an emergency to go do something else. So then you miss the opportunity to go vote. Just do it early. Go vote Go vote early. Take care of it then. All right. So um, everybody uh, go vote and make a difference. Make a difference. And uh, Maritza, I want to thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having uh, me. It was a lot of fun. Very yeah. informative, and uh, we wish you luck. Thank you. And uh, I want to remind everybody to please subscribe to Desde Cero con Manuel and uh, keep supporting the channel. And we want to wish uh, Maritza good luck and uh, 
and good luck in your future. Thank you. I appreciate you. And uh, we see you all next time. And uh, thank you all for watching. And uh, again, uh, good luck and, and go get it. All right. All here right. we go. Giddy right. up, right? See you all. Bye. See you all next time.